But uh, to start out, Dr. Eric Feigelding is with us, the epidemiologist and health, accountist, uh, health economist. He's an adjunct senior fellow with the American Federation of Scientists, formerly a faculty member and researcher at the Harvard Medical School and the uh, Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. You can follow him on Twitter, which is where I, uh, you know, I just uh, hang on his every pronouncement at Dr. Eric Ding, E-R-I-C-D-I-N-G, D-R-E-R-I-C-D-I-N-G, -E over on Twitter. One of the must-follow Twitter, fo Twitter uh, threads, or uh, whatever you call it, uh, posters out there. Dr. Feigelding, welcome back to the program. It's, uh, it's great to have you with Thanks. us. Um, can you describe for us the difference between something being pandemic and something being endemic? Because it seems to me that uh, coronavirus is on the verge of becoming endemic, unless I'm misunderstanding that word. Right. Uh, thank you for having me. I think uh, epidemic and pandemic are obviously uh, talks about the rising of a new virus, a pandemic being a global version of a new virus. But the issue with endemic means it's been with uh, that it's been with us for so long that it just lives with us. We just can't sort of uh, like the flu. We can't eradicate it. And you, but usually it means it has like a low level of seriousness and severity. Like we have endemic chickenpox. You know, kids eventually get chickenpox. Um, endemic uh, common cold and and usually these kind of things. I would not describe the SARS-CoV-2 as endemic yet. It's very much a brand new virus mm -hmm. and it is extremely deadly that we should not just live with it. At yeah. the same time. Well, I guess my, my larger question then is, um, you know, we're all envisioning, or we were prior to the Delta variant, a time when enough of us were vaccinated that we could just, you know, pull the plug on this thing and declare it like we did with polio and smallpox you know, it's gone. And it certainly doesn't seem the case. Um, and, and, you know, even, even though it now has been, at least for those people who are vaccinated, reduced from something that's going to kill you or put you in the hospital uh, down to something that gives you a bad head cold. Um, but, you know, how, how do you yeah. see this sh shaping out um, with where we are at now in the United States? Yeah, I think before the Delta variant, there was a really good chance we could eradicate it. Uh, but with the rise of Delta variant, it's gonna create a different type of problem because the Delta variant, you know, there's data that not only does it circulate in minks, but 50% of all wild deer in Michigan are now infected. Wow. And, uh, the, the, and if it's just deer that's infected, you know many other animals like, uh, uh, like uh, you know, rodents and um, uh, and other animals or raccoons potentially are someday as well. But the, the issue is like it, because it's so much more contagious, and now it's hard to stop. And if it has an animal reservoir to live in, particularly dogs or cats, eradicating in humans means you know animals that could potentially come back and infect us, even if we eradicate it for animals. And uh, the head of eradication for smallpox, Dr. Larry Brilliant, says it's when you have a heavy animal reservoir infection, you can't eradicate it anymore. So the problem is, are we reaching that state that because it's so contagious that we can't eradicate? It's not, I would not call it endemic yet because endemic by definition means low severity and living with us for a long time. I yeah. don't know if this is going to be a low severity thing. Hopefully, we will eventually get to a point where it's low severity. But in India, don't forget, India, the Delta variant, also formerly known as the Indian double mutant variant, it killed about one to three million people in uh, two months. So this is something that we cannot just live with. This is something that, um, you know, as on the human scale and toll, we should not ever live with. But at this rate currently, it could, with so many vaccine-hesitant people, it could burn through the forest. Yeah. Like, you shouldn't live with a, if you're in a forest, you shouldn't live with forest fires. You still have to put them out. But the problem is, if you don't stop it with anything else, it's going to burn through the forest until there's nothing left. 
And that is the calamity that we're seeing in some countries that's now faced with the Delta variant on an actual if, if this If this virus has mutated in a way that allows it to easily jump into other mammals, you mentioned, you know, half the deer in Michigan now have it. Um, and, and there's a lot of deer in Michigan. I grew up in Michigan. Um, how far away are we from it jumping to dogs and cats? And then if it jumps into feral uh, dog and cat populations, uh, you know, this becomes a reservoir that echoes back against humans constantly. Yeah. And the bad news is it has already jumped into dogs and cats. That's already been proven. Mm -hmm. um, and the issue has, can it jump back? We technically don't have any proof that it can jump back to us. But, mm -hmm. it, you know, lack of proof is not proof that it doesn't do it happen. Right. Um, we know it jumps into minks, and we have proof it jumps back from minks to humans on mink farms. This is where you hear all the millions of minks infected, and, and so we've actually proven that it jumps into minks, mutates in minks, and jumps back into the human with the new mutated form. That's already been proven. And uh, the other thing is previously uh, the old Wuhan version 1.0 could not infect mice. It could not because unless the mice had a certain uh, receptor, it just could not infect mice. Guess what? And according to the studies a couple months ago, it doesn't eat alpha variant, which is the UK variant that developed over the winter time. We don't even, it, it doesn't even need the special gene um, that the old Wuhan version needed. Now it can directly infect mice. If it infects mice and rats, oh, you know that it, this is gonna come back to us. So and it doesn't require the- We've seen it. So basically the writing's on the wall that it could jump back to us. And the question is, eventually will it become by itself mutated so mild that we can live with it? Or is it gonna be that we're gonna need a burn through before the world hits that level and going through a burn through in which the forest gets burned of all fires before the, the wildfire ends is not the outcome that we want in this society but at the stage where we're headed in florida and many other places where, where there's no mass very low vaccinations that's where we're headed and that is the really scary future burn through meaning lots and lots of people dying getting sick and dying um, which raises the question, there's this new variant, the Lambda variant. I, I was reading about this in, in Nature yesterday, that, that they believe that it, it is uh, more deadly and perhaps more contagious than even the Delta variant. Tell me about what you know about Lambda, about this Lambda variant. And the Lambda variant is a new variant. It's still not a variant concern yet. It's still a variant of investigation. And the question is, how dangerous is it? We really don't know. It's so early, we don't have enough clinical studies on Lambda. Lambda is one of those big, big question marks. But it has the hallmarks of potentially a really dangerous one because it has lots of bad mutations. Uh, it's been found in several countries as well. Um, whether or not it's faster than Delta, there's one way to know. If it start replacing delta uh, incre with increasing frequency, then you'll know it's faster than delta. Um, so we just start winning. It was faster than any other variant virus because it was replacing all the other strains, like wildfire. Yeah. But so it's, we it's, haven't seen the lambda to replace delta at a high high risk pace yet. Yeah. So it's it's just essentially a, a Darwinian process. Um, but where is the lambda right now? Do we uh, has it popped up in the United States yet? It has popped up in the U.S. But it's very rare. Um, we don't have a good assessment. It, it's, it's many countries around the world, um, but again, there's there's many variants that will pop up. It has not been rated. Sir. There's a variant of under investigation, variants of interest. Those um, are pop up. Uh, you know, dime a dozen, but for that to become a variant concern, we have to see some real smoking gun, see some, you know, fire in the theater kind of uh, moment before we shout on it. And that's in certain ways, that is a very subjective thing. Like WHO declared Delta a variant concern back in 
uh, early May, first week of May. Uh, USCDC didn't declare a variant of concern until mid-June, June 15th, a whole month and a half. And I think we lost a lot of time containing Delta because the WHO said it's it's bad. WHO says put your mask on, and CDC is like, nah, we don't need to do that. Ah, it's not a variant of concern. No, 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 we don't need to do that. Delta, you know, the WHO has a different standard of care uh, than than uh, we do. Um, and you know, CDC in certain ways hand waved for an extremely long amount of time, and so. I, I'm obviously on the precautionary principle side, uh, but I think, you know, precautionary with data. And I haven't seen really that much data on Lambda yet. So let's let's be patient. So let's uh, not jump the gun. We It's not like we don't have a wildfire right now, and it's Delta. The same thing that controls Delta would control Lambda. Um, but we just have to – our main problem, it's kind of like fruits and vegetables. Everyone knows you need to eat your fruits and vegetables. Most people don't eat their fruits and vegetables, right? Uh, everyone who smokes knows smoking is bad, but they still smoke. A lot of this comes down to behavior and behavioral economics, not just epidemiology. And this is why I'm a behavioral health economist as well, because I know that in the end, you, in society, you need carrots, and sometimes you need sticks to make sure people do what they need to to protect themselves. And right now, it, we need to start using sticks more to really stop the epidemic. About the coronavirus, it, 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 speaking of Lambda, you know, you mentioned that the Lambda uh, variant, uh, you know, is just popping up in a few places. It hasn't been identified as a variant of concern. Uh, we still need to learn more about it. But looking at viruses and their evolution through a through a, a, a kind of a neo-Darwinian lens, it seems like. On the one hand, a virus would always want to, uh, a deadly virus, would always want to mutate in the direction of becoming less and less deadly so it would have more and more hosts and a greater chance of transmission. Yet that's not what happened with smallpox. Or, or maybe it is. I, I guess smallpox wiped out uh, Native American societies in ways that were way beyond how, how it did uh, European societies who had been living with it for 500 or 1,000 years. Um, what, but, uh, you know, uh, clarify that for me. How, how do viruses evolve in relationship to how deadly and how contagious they might be? And how might that inform us in expectations with Lambda and Omega and, you know, going or all the way through to Omega, going, going forward with new variants with regard to this, uh, this virus? Question, you know, the old saying was that viruses will become less deadly. That's not always true. Um, like with SARS coronavirus, it's really been sobering for a lot of the uh, virologists who've said uh, that previously. I think there is truth that a virus can't be too deadly. Like, for example, uh, Ebola and some of the other, like MERS, uh, Ebola had a 50% uh, mortality. MERS, which is Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus, uh, in, like six, seven years ago, was about uh, 35% of fatality. It's a, if you got infected, your fatality was 35%. That's a little bit too high for it to become a pandemic. The pandemic, the perfect virus for pandemic is extremely contagious. Um, it kills uh, a decent number of people, but not enough that it, it, it creates a breaking system. And if, if you're at 35% mortality, it, it creates a breaking system against uh, it spreading. You need it to be asymptomatic enough, enough, uh, p and mild enough in the people that it keeps going, uh, but severe enough in um, the remainder that it really cuts them down. Uh, in terms of way, that's the combination of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and Wuhan was, you know, perfect at that moment because uh, no one had any immunity. It was like basically a virus that arrived in. Um, you know, like just like the Europeans brought it to the new world, no one had immunity, and it ripped through the population. Now we obviously have some immunity to say from a combination of natural immunity but plus vaccines. But then this gives way to Delta, which is much more contagious, uh, more severe, but also very one dose vaccine invasive. You know, what we used to have uh, one dose used to be like 75% efficacy. Now one dose is less than 30%, 18% uh, 
um, in, in fact, for AstraZeneca one dose on, in one study. And of course, two dose, very evasive now. We're no longer 95% efficacy, we're talking about 60, 70%, and one uh, study showed 40% efficacy. So that is how you survive. And not necessarily being more deadly, but more evasive, but still keeping your, you know, deadly slash more severe properties. You being the virus. Crossing into 35%. But that, you know what, if we had a 35%, it would just be, it would be like bubonic plague bad. But in certain ways, even at the 2% CFR that we are seeing, um, 1%, uh, you know, the actual infection fatality ratio, including the asymptomatic, was about 0.6. That is enough to do everything that is done to us in the last year. Wow. And now Delta variant is four times more severe among the unvaccinated, four times. As in, if one person went to the hospital before last year for capita, four times, uh, four times that now for Delta. And this is where Delta has taught us it is more severe and it is the 2.0 pandemic virus. And it's it, we cannot rely on just being it will become less severe over yeah. time. Doctor, doc you can, you yeah. know, I think we should just be re really, really cognizant. This is still going to be with us for quite a while and very dangerous. Yeah. Uh, we have a little less than a minute before we're going to hit a hard break here. Um, it, it seems to me like the CDC has gone gun shy. You mentioned how, you know, they, they missed a few months of time with the Delta variant. Um, and a lot of our listeners are, 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 are saying, you know, we never should have stopped masking, for example. What are your thoughts yeah. on that? Oh, yeah, I've been saying that forever. The, the moment CDC announced shouting at the rooftops, or shouting on CBS News that CDC made a grave mistake. Now everyone says, oh, yeah, yeah, CDC mistake. Oh, back, back then, a lot of people <laughs> didn't want to say that. But mm -hmm. I've been saying CDC's been making a grave mistake from the very beginning. And it's, it's because we know asymptomatic transmission's been there. Now, Singapore data shows there's asymptomatic transmission there's mild transmission among the vaccinated. The proof was there in the pudding. It just, if you had looked for it, it was there. And CDC just kind of like put its head in the sand like an ostrich and just ignored all those data. And yeah. I think that's the gravest Not you know, a good concern. Thing. And that's why it was a big mistake. Dr. Eric Feigelding, you follow him on Twitter at Dr. Eric Ding. Hang on just a second. Listening to the Tom Hartman program. Call 202-808-9925. Dr. Feigelding, thanks so much for dropping by. It's always great Thank talking you. with you.